Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning and nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. And so with that, I welcome you. And please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. If you missed last week's episode with Carlos Fonseca, I do beg your pardon. Sorry, my phone just went off. If you missed last week's episode with Carlos Fonseca, Priya Jane, and Rita Dove, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Bird's Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you missed something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts readings by and conversations with Frank Bedart and Robert Lopez. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, many of you have probably already discovered the chat to the right of your page. Please feel free to comment there. If you have a question, please use the question tab at the bottom of the page and I'll go there to look for your questions. At the bottom of the screen is also a green link to this episode on Bird's Books website where you can purchase the author's books while supporting the bookstore and Write America. Our first speaker is Robert Lopez. Robert Lopez is the author of three novels, Part of the World, Can Be Belongo, Mean River, named one of the 25 important books of the decade by HTML giant, all back full and two-story collections asunder and good people. His fiction, nonfiction, and poetry have appeared in dozens of publications, including Bomb, The Three Penny Review, Vice Magazine, New England Review, The Sun, and the Norton Anthology of Sudden Fiction Latino. A new book, A Better Class of People, was published in March of this year. Dispatches from Puerto, Puerto Nowhere, his first nonfiction book, will be published by $2 Radio in March 2023. He teaches at Stony Brook University and has previously taught at Columbia University, the New School, Pratt Institute, and Syracuse University. Please welcome to the screen, Robert Lopez. Let me find you, Robert. Thank you, Alice. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody reading with Frank. I want to thank Roger for setting this up and curating this series for as long as he's done now. Um, I'm gonna read a bunch of little short pieces and then stop. This one is called, one of my daughters is called Resnick. The bruised parts of a banana are poison. I've gone up to people on street corners. I've said, the bruised parts of a banana are poison. I've said, you mustn't eat them. I never use the word mustn't unless I'm talking about the bruised parts of bananas. Only young actresses say the word mustn't out loud. They are permitted because they have long curly hair and pretty polished toes. They say, I mustn't eat this whole box of cookies right now. Or they say, I mustn't allow complacency and ennui within a city block of my long curly hair and pretty polished toes. I've seen them on street corners and I've said to them, the bruised parts of a banana are poison. I've said, you mustn't eat them. Some of the young actresses thank me for saving their lives and others don't thank me at all. These thankless ones walk away quickly in some other direction. I like the way the thankless ones walk. So it's always fine with me when this happens. The ones who do thank me are my favorites though. They have the longest, curliest hair and their prettiest polished toes. 
I tell them all about what is poisonous in the world. Envelopes you have to lick with your tongue, green bell peppers, vitamin C with rose hips, and so on. To make myself clear, I ask them, what the hell is a rose hip? Not one of them ever knows the answer. What they say is, I mustn't allow Mr. Resnick to push me around anymore. I tell them they are absolutely right about this. Then I ask, who is Mr. Resnick? And they answer, he is the director, silly. This is another word young actresses say out loud, and there's nothing wrong with it. I like it when the young girls call me silly. I always ask how they know my name is silly, and they laugh. Eventually, I tell them I understand what they are saying. And then I say, one of my daughters is called Resnick, as a way of relating to them. This is when that gut love connection explodes all over everyone. It fills the universe. At this moment, they know they have to trust that gut love connection because this is what it means to be alive and on the planet. This is what they have waited their entire lives for. Now I invite them home so we can eat unbruised bananas and make long polished gut love all night. On the way, I tell them the world is full of all kinds of poison and we have to be careful. I tell them we have to live inside our gut love and not let anyone else in. I tell them I will save their lives every day forever if only they let me. Okay, this next one is called In Alabama, the Tuscaloosa. Someone approached me on the street. It was broad daylight, appalling. Questions were put to me as if I might know something. The first had to do with my birthplace. I told them I couldn't remember, but I've been told different things by different people. Then they asked if I was interested in making extra money. I told them stories need to be verified. I told them I would look into it and get back. I said I needed more time. Then they asked if I had any extra time on my hands. I told them I have carpal tunnel syndrome. I said it hurts to even shake hands with someone, that I can't even drink a glass of water. I said I have to use plastic cups and straws, like a child. By this time, their expressions had changed. I think they wanted to go home now. This is when they asked about my future. They said, are you ready for it? I told them even the wayside has fallen by the wayside here. I said, take a look around you. I said, I can't see three feet in front of me. I said I was nearsighted or farsighted, whichever one means you can't see three feet in front of you. I said, I shot an elephant in my pajamas once. And then I said, how he got in my pajamas, I have no idea. This is when they thanked me very much for the time and courtesy and told me to have a great day. I should, should have told them to go do the same, but I asked them to look into my eyes instead. I said, which is it, please? Tell me, am I nearsighted or farsighted? They didn't even bother looking. Okay, those two bits were from a book called Asunder that came out a long time ago. And this next bit is titled A Cloud That Looks Like Jesus from a book called Good People. I leave the house because it's a better chance of getting killed off out there all at once. I'm sure the apartment I live in is killing me off, but it's taking its time so far, and it might take years to finish. Why I think this is my eyes always burn in the apartment, and I cough a lot. I try to remember to buy eye drops and cough medicine when I leave the house, but I almost never do remember. Why I don't remember is I think about getting run over by trucks or shot to death by hoodlums instead. I see the truck speeding by and imagine what it would feel like to get run over by one. I'm sure it would hurt. I saw a movie once where a woman was run over by a truck and she lived on for about five minutes afterward. This woman was covered in blood and lying face up on the concrete after she got run over by the truck. Actually, I think it was a city bus that ran her over. 
But what difference does that make after you're already run over? Once you're run over, it doesn't matter what kind of vehicle did it to you. She didn't understand what had happened or why it happened to her. This is something I know all about. I don't need a city bus to run me over to not understand what happens to me and why. The list of things that I don't understand about the world could fill up four city buses, if not more. I shouldn't even get into it, so I won't, except to say that I don't know what it is in my apartment that's killing me. There's some kind of poison in there coming in through the pipes or up from the basement or down from the roof. But I'd rather get into this woman whose legs had been separated from the rest of her, I think. I was trying not to look, so I can't say for sure what happened. It seemed that part of her had been severed. Part of her was elsewhere. Maybe it was parts that were elsewhere. It wasn't what I wanted to see, as I don't like the sight of blood, of parts, of ripped open innards. I imagine it would be the same if I'm the one run over, that I wouldn't want to look down and see what parts of me have been separated from the rest. I'd rather look straight up at the sky. Maybe it's a cloud up there, a cloud that looks like something else, maybe a president or Jesus. I've never seen this kind of cloud, but I've heard other people do. I think that'd be a nice thing to see after getting run over. This woman that did get run over though, she didn't look up at the sky at all, let alone see a cloud that looked like Jesus up there. A young lady was trying to comfort the woman as she lay dying, the parts that remained intact. She cradled the dying woman's head in her hands. I wonder if I get run over by a truck, if someone would do this for me. I don't think anyone's ever cradled my head before, so it seems doubtful they'd start then. This woman that got run over though, she had a nice head and I'm sure some people cradled it before the truck ran her over. People probably took strands of her hair and took them behind her ears. They probably smiled as they did this to her. This woman, it appeared as if she didn't want to get run over by the truck that ran her over. It appeared that she had better things to do than get run over by a truck that day. My problem is most days I don't have anything better to do. So if I do get run over by a truck, I hope this comes across to whomever might see me lying there. I hope they realize that this man had nothing better to do today. So it's just as well this truck ran him over. I hope they realize that this man's apartment was killing him off anyway, and that it was best to get it over with all at once. Maybe this will be the day that I finally remember to buy eye drops and cough medicine. Maybe the truck will run me over on my way home from the drugstore, and the person that cradles my head in the street will go through my pockets for identification and find the drops in medicine. Maybe I'll ask them to pour some drops into my eyes so they won't burn as I look up at a cloud that looks like Jesus. Even still, I should think I'd like a hoodlum to come over and fire two rounds into my head rather than have this same hoodlum cradle me in his arms and then have this hoodlum pour eye drops into my eyes so I could look up at the clouds. I should think I'd like everything to end all at once and forever should it come right down to it. So to hell with the cloud that looks like Jesus. Sometimes when I do go out into the street and walk around, I try to eyeball the hoodlums to see if they're really as tough as they seem. See if they want to throw a couple of shots my way, because that's preferable to getting run over by a bus, depending on their marksmanship. The list of what I don't understand might take up 12 city buses, but I at least know that much about the world. Okay, I will stop there and thank everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Robert. I really appreciate it. Our next speaker is Frank Bedard, whose phone call I just got interrupted at the very beginning, but made it onto the screen. So our tech test is averted so far. So Frank is the Frank Bedard is the author of many collections of poetry, including Metaphysical Dog, Watching the Spring Festival, Stardust, Desire, and in Western Night Collected Poems, 1965 to 1990. He won many prizes, including the Wallace Stevens Award, the Bulletin Prize for Poetry, 
and the National Book Critics Circle Award. His book, Half Light, Collected Poems, 1965 to 2016, won the 2018 Pulitzer Prize and the 2017 National Book Award. His latest book of poetry, Against Silence, was released in November of 2021. He lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Please welcome to the screen, Frank Bedard. And Frank, I'm gonna pull you out of the audience here. It's gonna take a minute to sign him on. Frank, it shows you as on screen, but I don't see you on screen. Okay, Frank. Frank, I have invited you on screen, but I have not seen you on screen. So you sure you want to invite Frank Bedard on screen? Yes. I'm going to remove you and I'm going to ask you again. And I'm going to ask you to try getting back on. I shouldn't have said that about. Okay. Frank, I'm probably sure that you can hear me, but I can't see you and neither can any one of us. So let's remove you and try you again. Maybe you can sign out and sign all the way back in. Let me try again. Frank, I don't see you on screen. And now here you are. Thank you so much for your patience, everyone. Frank, I'm so glad you're here. Okay, can you hear me too? Uh, Alice, I can't hear you. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Yes, we can hear you very clearly and thank you for your patience. Okay. I'm gonna read a number of poems uh, and end with a new poem. Uh, in five parts. Anyway, let me start with, uh, it's called An American in Hollywood. Uh, I'm living in a retirement community now, and uh, I watch a lot of movies on TV. And uh, I have a wonderful TV that is the best delivery system I've ever had for films. Um, so I feel very lucky. Can you see me now? Yes, sir. We can see and hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Let me um, uh, let me read a poem about Hollywood. Um, it's called An American in Hollywood. And the, the joke, obviously, is behind this is an American in Paris. An American in Hollywood. After you were bitten by a wolf and transformed into a monster who feeds on other human beings each full moon, and who therefore in disgust wants to die, you think the desire to die is not feeling suicidal. It abjures mere action. You've wanted to die since the moment you were born. Crazy narratives that lend what is merely in you and therefore soon to be repeated, the fleeting illusion of logic and cause. You think those alive there in the glowing rectangle lead our true lives. They have not, as we have been forced to hear, cut off their arms and legs. There you dance as well as Fred Astaire, though here inexplicably you cannot. Sewer still black water above whose mirror you bend your face font i think movies have always been a font Uh, 
Frank is obviously having some connectivity problems. I'm going to do my best to get him back. And he seems to be accepting and connecting in. And we'll see if that works. It's one of the reasons he called me earlier during the introduction. So we'll just get there. Frank, I'm going to re-invite you in and we'll go from there. I don't want to miss a minute. Oh, oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. No. Uh, this is the poem called The Old Man at the Wheel. Measured against the immeasurable universe, no word you have spoken brought light. Brought light to what as a child you thought too dark to be survived. By exorcism, you survived. By submission, then making. You let all the parts of that thing you would cut out of you enter your poem because enacting there all its parts allowed you the illusion you could cut it from your soul. Dilemmas of choice, given what cannot change, alone roused you to words as you grip the things that were young when you were young, they crumble in your hand. Now you must drive west, which in November means driving directly into the sun. about everything. Everybody already knows everything, so you can lie to them. That's what they want. But lie to yourself. What you will lose is yourself. Then you turn into them. For each gay kid whose adolescence was America in the 40s or 50s, the primary, the crucial scenario forever is coming out or not, or not, or not, or not, or not. Involuted velleities of self erasure. Quickly after my parents died, I came out. Foundational narrative designed to confer existence. If I had managed to come out to my mother, she would have blamed not me, but herself. The door through which you were shoved out into the light was self-loathing and terror. Thank you, terror. You learned early that adults' genteel fantasies about human life were not for you, life. You think sex is a knife driven into you to teach you that. Uh, who my felt like a we're going to work on it. Try and get him back.
Frank, you need to re you need to accept and invite and um, reconnect again. He's really not even showing up. This this is really. I'm sorry about this, but his Wi-Fi is really spotty. Here he is. He's coming back. Just accept and, and reconnect, Frank. Sorry about this, folks. We'll get him back and we'll... I really want to hear more of his poetry. I'm sure you do too. Come on, Frank. Another good reason to move over to Cardcast. I mean, over to Zoom. Come on, Frank. Reprompt. Well, we'll try this for a little while, and then it looks like what we'll probably do is bring Robert back on screen and do some talking about it. I know. Connectivity. Try him again. Well, this is discouraging. I'm sorry. The irony is, is that we spend so much time on a screen that to have it be finicky now, after all that we've been through, is ironic. Come on, Frank. I'm not getting him. Um, let's see here. Robert, I'll see if you have another couple of pieces. Let me see. Let me get you back up on screen. Robert, we're having trouble yes. getting Frank back in. It's just, it's, I keep prompting him and he can't get in past, I, I, it just, he's got a very weak Wi-Fi and it's just been cutting in and out. Um, would you like to read some more? I could do such a thing, um, at least for, you know, until... Frank I'm gonna reappear. I'm gonna keep working on Frank, and if he re pops in, then you guys can we can just go from there. Is that good for you? Sure, that works. Let me let me see what I could uh, what I could find. I'm not abandoning. Oops! It sounds like it looks like he's connecting. We just don't. All right, let's. We don't want to leave people without listening to some wonderful work. 
It says accepted and connecting. Hmm. Okay, let's wait. Just a second. Would Robert talk about Alabama and New York City and his mental imaginary terrain? Go now. We're gonna we're gonna get to questions now. I promise. Yeah, Rob Frank's really not making it back in. So why don't I let okay, you go? And if he magically appears on screen, then we'll go from there. All right, I'll read a a, a bit from the newest book, A Better Class of People. Um and I'll try to keep it find a real short one. This is called the Dahlberg Repercussions. The woman on the subway looked like my mother. So I sat down next to her and said, you look like my mother. I said, does it seem like that to you? That you are someone who looks like my mother and that I look like someone who could be your son? If circumstances were different, that is. If you were old enough to be my mother or I were young enough to be your son. I said, don't misunderstand me. I said, you look like how my mother used to look, not how she looks now, although my mother still looks good, and I didn't mean to imply otherwise. I said, my mother is a good-looking woman, and that bodes well for all of us. I'm talking about genes now more than anything else. The truth is, I haven't seen my mother in 20 years because she won't have anything more to do with me. So when I said my mother looks good now, it's only speculation. I remember her own mother, my grandmother, that is, and she kept her looks well into her 70s. This is when the woman who looked like my mother said, excuse me, sir, and I admonished her for being so formal. I said, how dare you with someone that could be your son if circumstances were different? I could tell she was from a better class of people. By the way she spoke and what she wore, and thus could never be my mother, but I kept on anyway. This is when the woman who looked like my mother got up from the bench and walked over to the doors. She stood there, staring straight into her own reflection and waiting for the next stop. She looked like a flagpole in an open field to me. It looked like she couldn't be toppled, like she was entirely unmovable, and that she would never acknowledge that she was someone who looked like my mother, or that I was someone who could be her son. Is Frank back? Not yet. Not yet. How about, um, I could read one more bit, maybe, and then perhaps we should pull the ripcord and uh, we, just we'll, go on to whatever comes. Yep, got it. Thanks. OK. Um, so let me, uh, let me see what I was doing there. Okay. About a hundred years ago, I wrote a poem and uh, this is that. It's called Somewhere Other Than Florida. Even before I begin, I should start over. Start with a horse set or a toothbrush. Something that takes up space on the earth. Something that would make a noise if you dropped it on the floor or if it dropped by itself. It shouldn't matter if it is alive or not, if it is a living thing. I have often mistaken a woman for an armoire, a dog for a pitchfork, a glass of beer for a butterfly. The cricket chirps through the night the same as a lawnmower cuts grass. There is no real difference, nor any reason they can't trade jobs tomorrow. The cricket and the lawnmower are both ready for the change. There is no proof it hasn't all been a grand mistake, ours to fix. I propose we reconsider all objects. The old woman on the train reading a magazine, a Japanese beetle crawling across the kitchen floor, an antique desk on the sidewalk outside a laundromat. Try to remember something you have no business remembering something you've never even tried to remember. 
the creme brulee at that restaurant downtown, the turbulence on the flight to Florida when you were 14, how the passengers hooped and hollered like they were on a roller coaster going fast, going too fast, going somewhere other than Florida. Okay. Thank you, Robert, so much. Frank, do you have anything else you want to read for us? Beg pardon? Can you hear me now and see me? I can hear you and see you. Thank you for working so hard to get back to us. I'm sorry, I've been trying for 15, 10 minutes. Uh, You're here. Okay. Well, I started, to, I started to read a poem called In Memory of Joe Brainerd. Uh, Joe died of AIDS in 1985. Um, uh, he was a very wonderful person, wonderful artist. His writing is very fresh and brilliant. Um, the Library of America has kept his work in print. There, um, uh, his sequence, I remember, is very famous and very often taught. Um, uh, and I, I was very lucky to meet him uh, before he died. And um, uh, altogether, meeting him was one of the great privileges of my life. This is called A Memory of Joe Brainerd. The Remnant of a vast oceanic bruise, wound delivered early and long ago, was in you, purity and sweetness, self-gathered, chosen. It's the moral sense that unifies and folks. I'm going to try and see if I can get Frank back, but I think I'm going to bring back Robert. And you and I can talk for a minute. Okay. Um, I see one question down here, and if you know if we can get Frank back, it's great. Um, what, Nell Painter asked the question of what's the meaning for our poets in severed limbs, and I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know. I, I think I remember when I was a kid, I used to not understand how nerve function worked, and I thought. If you lost a, a, a digit or, or say a limb, it, it, it wouldn't hurt because it wouldn't be there anymore. It's gone. Um, and there's something about the disembodied parts that, that happen during catastrophic injury that uh, I don't know. It, it might, maybe it's interesting to think about. I don't, I don't spend too much time thinking about it. Though. So it's not like starfish. <laughs> I don't believe so. Uh, what advice do you give uh, young writers starting out to write their first book? Um, I mean, generally, don't do it. You know, try to find something else to do. Uh, <laughs> but if you feel Seriously. like you must, 
<laughs> um, if you feel like you must, just yeah, listen to your own page, which is advice I have stolen from uh, the great writer and poet Peter Marcus, who is a dear friend of mine. He says, listen to your own page. So I think you have to be relentlessly yourself and find ways to utilize all of your own issues and problems and talents and, and make something that is uniquely yours. So that would be my advice. Have you ever gone on any kind of a special pilgrimage to do research for something you were writing that, that is unusual or different or something you want to share with us? Um, no, uh, I go to the tennis court about three or four days a week. And uh, I have a book coming out in Tuesday that uh, tennis plays a big part on Tuesday. I have a book coming out in March, probably on a Tuesday. Um, Always on a Tuesday. That, uh, yeah. Um, that, uh, that tennis plays a big part in. And it's my first nonfiction book. And I've done some research for it. And I visited uh, my, my grandfather's uh, resting place, the cemetery where he is buried uh, in New York. And I hadn't been there since 1987. So I suppose that might be the, uh, the most appropriate answer to your question. Well, it's, it's always, you know, people go to various different things to get inspiration or research or so forth. And it, you just never can gauge the answer. Um, what's your writing kryptonite? Oh God, that's an interesting question. Um, I think myself, I think, uh, my own self is, is the kryptonite that, uh, gets in the way. Huh. Okay. Um, Typically what comes, I, I, this is a really trite question, but it's a legitimate one. What typically comes to you first, the characters or the plot or the, the structure of the book or? It's always language that comes first for me. Oh. So I have sentences, lines, um, and it's never something as abstract as, as an image or a character. It's always language and everything I've ever written, be it a short story, a flash fiction, a novel, um, or the nonfiction, it always comes from language. I wouldn't know how to, to go anything else. That's interesting. Um, do you have a book that you've read that you wish you had written? Oh God, that, that, I imagine there's a there's a, a, a bunch of them, um, and I would go back and say perhaps uh, "Leaves of Grass" by Walt Whitman. I wish I'd uh, written that. Oh. Well, you know, I'm sitting here, as you say that, my mind starts to go into the books. <laughs> I forget. Sure. Um, there's, uh, what are you reading now? And is it pleasure or research? Um, I am reading, today, I opened up uh, David McCullough's uh, book on the Brooklyn Bridge because David oh, McCullough right. uh, passed away. Uh, yeah, so I'm a big fan of his, and I'm revisiting his uh, brilliant book on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, so that's that's what a what wonderful tribute is to pick up an author's book and read it on the day that they, you know, wander off into the great yeah. unknown. Uh, Philip asked in the chat, Robert, do you ever distrust your voice like the distinctive voices you cultivate? What do you do when they take over? Uh, thank you, Philip. I'm glad to see you here. Um, no, I never distrust my voice. 
my voice is the most trustful thing that I have access to. I don't know. I, do I distrust the voice? No, I never do. The voice is always right on. I mean, there might be some missteps along the way, uh, but the voice that has been cultivated over this 30 years that I've been at this, um, I, I, I've come to rely on it and trust on, trust it. And, you know, I'm not sure it's distrust, but at sometimes I think it was uh, Gordon Lish who said, uh, you get bored with your own tricks. So maybe that comes along every so often, uh, getting bored with your own tricks. But I, w I wouldn't think of voice as a trick, but perhaps it is. I want to be sure there's no other questions from either the chat or not yours. Um, Alabama and New York and his mental imagery terrain. Great title. Okay. Um, other questions from the crowd? Or the cast. Or the cast. Because I've gotten into what you're reading, but... Um, I'm very excited about your new book coming out. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully finding some readers for it. What kind of process was it for you to get published? Uh, for this book? Yes. Or well, in general, I mean, some people, it's like pulling teeth getting a book published, and other people, they just call a friend, which I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I would think common anymore. I mean, uh, I've, so I've worked with a bunch of different publishers, Design Books, Bellevue Literary Press, um, and now $2 Radio. And, and each uh, process has been uh, slightly different. So, um, yeah, I think one of the things that w you could do to, if you're looking to get published, is you have to be active in the world and, 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 and go out and, and, and go to readings and, and write emails and letters and comments. And um, a couple of the, the things that I've done, for instance, a $2 radio book, uh, I interviewed a friend of mine who published a book with them. Sarah Rose Etter is her name. She had a great book a couple of years ago called The Book of X. And I interviewed her for that book. And um, Eliza Jane of $2 Radio contacted me a few years later asking me would I be interested in perhaps looking at another one of their writers for an interview. And uh, I said, absolutely not. But I, uh, I said, I've got a book. And uh, maybe you'd like to take a look at it, you and, and your husband, Eric. And uh, they did. And X amount of months later, they came fishing around wanting to publish it. So I think bravo. that kind of thing happened. Well, bravo, yeah. because I, you know, I've heard some stories that seem to be seamless, but it gets a little bit dicey now and then because of, I mean, on my end of things, we're talking about printing delays and the printing queue and a lot of that. Oh, and, sure, yeah. And they've encouraged all of us. Most of us have already bought what we need for the holidays just because we, wow, have, to, yeah. we have to. We have to. So I always track where people's books are and who they're coming from and how easy they are to get. And so I'm always interested to hear what your side of it is from, you know, did something just fall into your lap or was it a social engagement or, or just serendipity, which I don't, Oh my goodness. Is that Frank? Frank. Awesome, man. <laughs> Robert, do you mind if we give Frank I a chance to read just a bit? Find... Not at all. Um, my only thing is I do have to leave at the top of the hour. So you got it. I, you got I it. I can step off now and you, everybody's heard more well, than enough from me. Frank is, has still having connectivity problems. He just went to a blank screen. Did he for you as well? Uh, yeah, I don't see Frank anymore. Frank is, yeah. Well, you know, what, why may do, what we may do is try and get Frank back when we can try and figure, maybe when we, for those of you who didn't kind of hear my snarky comment about Crowdcast, 
we're going to con we're going to convert this show over to Zoom after Labor Day weekend. So we're everybody seems to have a better time getting on Zoom. We've sort of survived the pandemic because of it. Cradcast is beautiful to look at, but difficult for presenters to get on. As you can well imagine, you know, Frank's been struggling with it all night long. So we're going to convert and it'll be a lot easier. And then we can stop going through all this technical problem on the show, which we've had the last couple of times for some reason. So um, I really appreciate your patience, Robert, because you've really sort of sat through this little circus in between these wonderful readings and sharing your work and talking about how you get your work to us, which I'm on the other end of it. And I want to know how it becomes one of the books on my shelf because I love, love, love your work. And I just want to make sure I sort of tap into authors and find out if it's still the, the publishing stream is still working for them because, sure. you know, so I really want to thank you for the time tonight and hearing your wonderful work. I'm going to think about the poor woman who's severed in the road somewhere for a very long time. And I just, I can't wait to get the book and read everything else in it. So thank you. Um, and I'm going to sign off for tonight. Folks, I'd like to thank Robert and Frank for participating in Write America this evening and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series to look forward to each Monday evening. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America. We hope to see you all next week on Monday the 15th at 7 as we welcome Denetis, Denisha Smith and David Nassau. Um, sorry we had some technical problems, but... I think we really had a wonderful show despite that. So thank you so much and have a good evening.